AKA has also been called the Queen of Rail Study, but I, I want the consultant to tell you why you shouldn't say that uh, here in a few minutes. But, um, but we'll be got, so most of the meeting will be dealing with the commuter corridor study. We finally got our consultants under contract, and it's of no fault of their own. I will, I'll blame ODOT because they're not here. And, uh, but we finally got them under contract, and we're pretty excited about it. It's going to be an 18 month study. And uh, it's going to be very extensive, and I, I anticipate there will be a lot of interaction with this group. And um, I hope you're as excited as we are about this, because we think this is going to be very worthwhile, regardless of what the results uh, come up with. I think with something we're going to be able to use. So, um, without further ado, I'll I'll turn it back to you, Mayor, if you like, and and uh, you can get what you need on the on the agenda going, and then we can introduce URS and their team. Great. Uh, so let me get a motion to approve the uh, January 23rd meeting summary. And a second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All right. Since we haven't heard from Doug in a while. <laughs> I appreciate that. Doug, would you like to introduce Diane? I will. Thank you very much. And like I said, um, you know, we're starting this community corridor study. And Diane Cowan, um, who's out of the Austin office of URS, she's our project manager on this study. Um, she, we're, we've one of the things when we, we looked at the consultants, um, we were really impressed with Diana. I must say, I'm not just saying it just because she's here. Yeah. I'd say it she was, but we were we were very delighted that she was going to be part of this team, and um, and you know she'll introduce everybody else. And like I said, we're very just very excited to get it going. And there's going to be some interaction today, a couple breakouts. I know everybody hates that stuff, but we think it's important. And uh, I'll let her fill you in on that. So, without further Thank ado, you. Diane. Thank you, Doug and Mayor. Um, I'm Diane Cowan, as Doug mentioned, uh, with URS. I am a uh, part of the national transit team for URS. Um, I'm really excited to get to work, as Doug alluded to. It's been a while since we started um, the contracting piece, so we're excited to really dig in and, and get going. Um, so overall, I'm the project manager, as I mentioned, and I'm going to let each one of the people that are speaking today just kind of introduce themselves quickly, what they are doing on the project, so you have a context. Good afternoon. My name is April Manlapas. I'm also with URS, and I will be leading the Edmund Corridor analysis. Oh, you can use them. I'm Christy <laughs> Pimpin. I am a sub-consultant to URS. I own Red Bud Marketing. We do marketing and business development support to professional service providers, but um, we are also a disadvantaged business enterprise through the Oklahoma Department of Transportation to provide public involvement support. And URS is serving as our mentor in this process to teach us how to do this for this type of study. So we're really stoked about bringing that to Oklahoma. And we are located in Norman. Ian, Ian Bryant, um, I'm also with URS. I'm the Deputy Project Manager of this. Paulette Vanderkamp with URS, and I'm the uh, Norman Corridor Lead. Andrea Beckmuller Berger. I used to work for ACOG for a long time. I am now a subconsultant to URS. I work for Alliance Transportation Group, and I will be the quarter lead for the Midwest City Corridor. All right. Thank you. And uh, let me interject. If, if, if you feel the ground shake, it's not because someone has said something astonishing. <laughs> <laughs> they are demolishing a building next door, and that's. We felt feel, a little so. bit, a little bit of that earlier, yeah. so I was hoping it wasn't something I said. So. <laughs> it's like, a, yeah, and I hope, hope no one gets motion sickness here. It's, it's, it's like a, like a poor man's IMAX today. <laughs> <laughs> well, luckily we're not doing any fly-throughs or anything like that to add to it. So, um, if I can, Mayor, I'll go ahead and jump in since I know we do have a full. Uh, agenda here. Obviously, we just went through the introductions. Um, we're going to go through a little bit about our public and stakeholder involvement process. Just give it, give you an overview so you understand what's upcoming from that standpoint. Um, we'll talk a little bit about why we look at particular indicators or data for transit, um, and then jump in and talk about some of those indicators and what we've seen as we've done our initial data collection and analysis in each one of the corridors individually. And um, then we're going to go into what uh, hopefully will be a good interactive session. Um, we're going to um, keep it short for you guys as, as best we can, try not to make it too painful. <laughs> and you'll notice in front of you, you've got little clickers. They look like old calculators.
coordinators, um, but we'll be using those to actually be able to do kind of an interactive voting session, which is kind of fun too. So um, hopefully by the time we leave here today, one of um, my goals is to have the goals <laughs> for the project meet for the project overall. So um, that's kind of our our focus for today towards the end. Okay, so I'll jump right in. Um, we came and talked to you uh, the end of last year. It was probably around, our, I think it was October 31st on Halloween. Um, and we came and just talked to you about the scope for the project in general. I just wanted to kind of give a quick um, recap since it has been a while. Um, the purpose of this project is really to go through and analyze the three corridors that came out of the 2005 fixed guideway um, study system plan that would have the highest propensity for transit to succeed. So those are, of course, the Edmond corridor, the Midwest City, and the Norman corridor. And this study is really at the end to have what is, con what is called a locally preferred alternative um, for each one of those corridors um, by the end. So uh, this is the typical stages that you go through during a commuter corridor study. You identify the existing conditions, you screen through um, some data once you identify some alternatives, you get really detailed on those alternatives that make it through, and then you refine those alternatives and define your LPAs or your locally preferred alternatives. Um, right now we're at the beginning part, we're at the identify, so we're identifying all the existing conditions and um, we'll start looking at corridors very soon. Um, our general approach whenever we do these studies is you not only want to have an evaluation of your alternatives and a, and a really good definition and development of a bunch of alternatives, but if you don't include the public and the agency in that, you won't really come out with what is considered a locally preferred alternative. Locally preferred <laughs> it means you've got to have people on board. You need the public and the stakeholders to really feel that this is the right corridor moving forward. So. Um, with that, uh, we're going to get into a little bit on our public and agency involvement objectives and how we're going to move forward. So our objectives for the community involvement process right now include engaging the community early and consistently throughout the study to demonstrate why this corridor plan is different from other plans that are out there and how it relates to those plans and the benefits of participating in the public involvement process to build trust, to follow through on what we said we're going to do, and to communicate in a timely and transparent manner. Inform stakeholders of the corridor study process and use creative tools like social media to get the message out there. To listen to each community and respond with straightforward and honest answers, keeping in mind and respecting the differences between each corridor and the communities that they serve. So how are we going to do this? First, we're going to put together a public involvement plan, and this will serve as our roadmap. The advisory committees will meet three times during this process. Once to develop the goals and objectives, once before the first round of the open houses, and once before the second round of open houses. There will be two sets of open houses during the course of the study. Each round will be held in three locations, one in each corridor. And information regarding the project will be put on a project website. This website will be updated monthly and then social media messaging will be included in that as well, hopefully. We'll prepare project status reports in the forms of e-newsletters and printed newsletters. The printed newsletters will, be, will come in handy at those open houses so that we can pass those out. And then also, we'll work closely with ACOG on those press releases and those media advisories. Thank you. Um, and just a little bit on the different advisory committees so you all have a sense of that. Um, we consider you all to be our steering committee. Um, the one that kind of guides and steers the project as it moves forward. Um, and then we have what we're calling kind of a stakeholder technical group that will involve some of the staff level individuals from the different cities, perhaps the county, um, ODOT, and others as appropriate. 
um, and then really getting into kind of more of a, a um, citizens advisory committee as well that would have concerned citizens or a head of um, homeowners associations, that sort of thing. Okay, so to start jumping into our transit indicators, so another, transit indicators are really what are things that you look at um, to make transit successful in a region. And here you can kind of see the brain used here. This is actually a, an image we've used um, showing how FTA is really using all, or the Federal Transit Administration is really now using a whole part of their brain. <laughs> they look at all aspects of transit and its benefits. It used to just look at what's the cost effectiveness of it, and that was really the main thing they looked at. Um, but now they're really working on looking at the economic development benefits that move forward. How can you value the existing communities that are there? How can you have affordable choices for people, whether it's transportation or how can the nexus with affordable housing and transit be um, looked into? Um, and also looking at how can you, with your local funding, how can you help level, leverage some of the federal funding. So these are the FTA kind of guiding principles, if you will, as they start to look at projects for um, receiving funding. <coughs> the reason they look at these things is because they do tend to um, also lead to successful projects. So we use these along with the goals that we will get from you all, from your community, and we'll use those to guide our study as we move forward. So a couple examples of some of these. I won't go through all of them, but you'll have it. Um, uh, obviously, these PowerPoints will be available to you after um, every meeting. So, um, for example, support existing communities. So we look for higher populations, where are the employment densities, where is it really a lot of employment happening, um, where do we find land use patterns that um, often lead to good transit. So maybe it's a mixed use um, area where you would have business and um, commercial as well as people living there would be a good one. Or if we're looking at an area that's maybe more single family or multifamily residential, well maybe we need to look at a park and ride kind of situation for either a bus or rail investment. <clears throat> so that's an example. So with that we've got, we've got animation apparently. <laughs> Thanks Ian. <laughs> to highlight some of those that we were covering today there in red. I, Presuming that's what that is. <laughs> so we'll cover the population, the land use, major activity, and um, some of the environmental suitability. Um, so our approach, we did obviously we came um, to the study with three corridors we needed to look at. Um, so the Edmond, the Midwest City, and the Norman. Um, all of them do center out of the Oklahoma City um, and really kind of radiate out of Oklahoma City is the downtown. Um, that makes obviously since there's the largest employment center is in downtown Oklahoma City. Um, however, as we really start to look, and a lot of the major employers, obviously 22 of them, um, but really as we start to study, one of the things we need to also be very cognizant of is that while we're looking at three distinct corridors, we could also um, end up tying corridors together because we can standing back and looking regionally, that's something that's important for us to do so that we can see if there are travel patterns that perhaps, um, you know, lend to stitching two of the corridors together for an investment. So we'll keep that in mind as well as we move forward. And with that, we'll get, we'll jump right into the corridor overview with April on Edmund. So in Edmond, we're looking at a 14-mile corridor, again, like Diane said before, uh, emanating from downtown and uh, going uh, to the north, um, to the city of Edmond. We're looking at um, uh, an increase in population of about 22% in a 30-year period between 2005 and 2035. That's equivalent to almost 290,000 people. Um, uh, increasing to 353,000 people. Now, I also want to point out the information that I'm presenting for Edmund um, have the same sources and references as the uh, data or information that will be presented by Andrea and uh, Paulette for, uh, with, uh, for uh, Midwest City and Norman as well. So for employment, um, 
we're looking at 25% that increase between that 30 year period, so about 231,000 jobs to 289,000 jobs um, in 2035. So where is uh, this growth um, anticipated to uh, to uh, happen? So And April, I'm just gonna interrupt you for okay. a second. Um, one thing I didn't make a point of stating is that to start the study, what we did is we did a um, three mile buffer on either side of an existing transportation corridor. And that's to really start the study, to start to collect that the, the information we need to start honing that in. Um, so just so you, when you see these numbers, um, some of them might not match what you're thinking of for your, you know, for different cities growth, but it's really within our study area boundary. So, so it's a three miles on either, on either side of it. And then at some point also we anticipate as we get more information and we get more detail that that buffer area will become narrower in focus. So this is the, uh, the map for the um, population density, I believe. So it's a thing, so the darker, the pink shading turning into red, the more dense we're looking at here. And then this is the uh, comparable information for employment density as well. So you can see that for employment, you see um, the downtown area over here, and then this uh, intersection of, uh, of uh, 44, as well as the uh, Broadway extension um, roadway. And then uh, when we combine them, we you see where where we have a uh, relative densities and um, uh, relatively dense areas in here. And then these purple uh, rectangles that you see here show you where there's um, relatively a uh, dense areas along this part of the study area for the corridor. So, um, you know, today, and it will continue on to the future, you will notice that um, these areas right here, by, you know, in the downtown area up here by uh, Edmund, Edmund and the Second Street um, corridor, uh, this part of uh, the Kilpatrick Turnpike as well, will continue to, continue to be dense in 2035. And then also I want to point out that some of these rectangles expand to the west a little bit, to the east a little bit, um, as shown with this smaller rectangle here, um, as well as this area over here. But generally you can see with the patterns of the colors and the darkness, uh, the varying darkness or lightness, that most of the uh, dense areas and development are and growth are anticipated to occur um, primarily on the western side of this study area. And can I ask a question? Yes. The, the growth patterns you illustrate, uh, both in employment and in population, mm -hmm. do those take into consideration the construction of the rail line itself? In other words, will those take place if we don't build it? Will those take place if we build it? Or are they separate mm -hmm. studies? I'm gonna, going to have to, uh, I believe that it. In, this is based on the um, financially constrained um, transportation network for the MPO, so probably does not include any improvements that would. Okay, so so if we were to believe that creating the line would create both population growth and employment growth in Edmond and along the line, then the, the numbers would be even larger if, if we were to build Correct. the line that we're to study. Okay, I, just wanted, I was just trying to get that clear. Yeah, th these numbers are based on ACOG's forecast, and, and it's you know, straight lines based on historic projections on, on our traditional growth. It doesn't have, like you said, it, does, it didn't do any, any scenario planning with regards to if commuter rail net was built, you know, what would it look like then? Um, and this part of the study will do that. So. Okay. So that's, that's an actually a really good point, Mayor, because um, as you can see, the, the good news is that there is concentrations along the corridor that, that has been identified previously, so that's always good to see. But obviously, also with transit investments, a lot of times communities are really looking for a concentration of some of that, um, whether it's residential or employment or access to. So it can act as an 